community. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Scott and Greg and I are so pleased to be here with you this morning, taking time to study deeply into God's Word. And this is the last lesson of the quarter. Um, and before we get into that, I am going to ask Greg if he would lead out in prayer. Be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. And we ask and pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be upon us to help us to focus on the principles that you want us to take to heart, to understand, and to share with others. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg. So this whole quarter we've been studying the theme of being in the crucible with Christ. And we've learned that a crucible crucible is a situation of severe trial in which different elements interact leading to the creation of something new and as Christians it's a new creation in Christ Jesus now there's usually suffering involved in crucibles how did suffering arise divine revelation gives us some insight some of God's creatures abused the freedom he had given them, and the result was sin and suffering. Why would an omniscient God allow this to happen? The freedom of all his intelligent creatures was so sacred that rather than deny us freedom, God chose to bear in himself the brunt of the suffering caused by our abuse of that freedom. And we see the suffering in the life and death of Jesus, who, through suffering in our flesh, has created a bond between heaven and earth that will last throughout eternity. There's no other divinity in the religions of the world who would condescend to make such a sacrifice. That is why biblical Christianity is called the religion of love and grace, from creation to salvation. God created us by grace and without our contribution because he loved us. And God saves us by grace without our contribution as well because he loved us. In salvation, we have a choice to accept or reject his action of grace. And after being saved by grace through Christ's death on the cross, each one of us has a choice to accept God's sacrifice in our place and return to his kingdom of light, grace, and loving, and love, being recreated in the image of God, or we can choose to reject his great salvation and disappear into eternal non-existence. What will you choose? This week we're going to focus on our ultimate example, Christ in the crucible. The memory text is found in Matthew 27, 46. And it reads, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ spoke these despairing words from the cross shortly before he died. He was feeling the full weight of the iniquity of us all. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of Jesus with supreme anguish. Due to the terrible weight of guilt, he couldn't see the Father's face, and, his pierced, and this pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. He felt that his Father had totally abandoned and deserted him, leaving him helpless. What adversity and anguish Jesus confronted on our behalf during his life here on earth. 
we're going to study that during this week's lesson. So we'll look into his birth, his ministry, and his death, touching upon the following points. On Sunday, we'll see Christ's early days, starting with his first hours of life, Jesus experienced human suffering and tragedy. Monday, he's despised and rejected of men. He was constantly misunderstood and falsely accused. Tuesday, we'll see Jesus in Gethsemane, the ultimate affliction on behalf of mankind. Wednesday, we'll study the crucified God and we'll see the significance of the events surrounding the moment of Christ's death. Thursday, we'll touch on the suffering God, and we'll finish understanding that adversity, yes, is part of life, but because of Christ's afflictions on this earth, we have the hope of eternal life beyond this life's suffering. And this week's lesson highlights two major themes. The first is Jesus Christ's suffering does not represent merely the suffering of another being. Rather, his affliction is the essence of God's love and salvation for us. Jesus Christ suffered for us in our place to rescue us from the power of sin, suffering, and death forever. So Jesus, the Son of God, died the death that represents God's judgment on sin. And then the second highlighted theme is what Jesus suffered in Gethsemane and what it means for us. So with that said, Scott, will you please tell us more about Christ's early days? Certainly. So in the early days, Jesus had to endure um, the crucible of the pressure of all his peers who were trying to get him to do wrong things, but Jesus would always deny them, which got him um, teased and made fun of by his peers. But let's, let's look at some of the scriptures that um, surround that. So in Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 7, it says, And she uh, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So here we're seeing that even from before Christ was born or at the time he was being born, <clears throat> he was born into... Uh, what should we call it, um, substandard conditions. So um, today if a child had been born in an um, animal shelter, it would seem like somebody would probably call Child Protective Services on them saying that they're uh, unsanitary conditions. So, um, so the point is, is that even from the very beginning, Christ had to endure sort of difficult circumstances. Uh, and then it, as Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 24 says, Now when the, uh, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought uh, him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer sacrifice to what is said in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So, I'm thinking what they're getting out of these verses is that um, because Jesus was part of the poorer class, I think they offered like a bird as a sacrifice as opposed to some larger animal. Um, so, <clears throat> and then it says, we're going to look at Matthew 2 verses 1 to 18. Um, and the question here is, what do we see these texts that give us indication of the kind of life Jesus faced from the start? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, King Herod the king uh, behold the wise, beheld the wise men uh, come from the east, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of all the people, he inquired of them where Christ is to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, uh, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring um, word back to me that I may come and worship him also. When, the, uh, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell on the ground and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts, of, uh, gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And then it talks about the flight into Egypt. Now when they arose, they departed, and an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he set forth to put to death all male children who were in Bethlehem and all districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then it was fulfilled what was spoken to Jeremiah the prophet, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Uh, so we see here that from the very beginning, Lucifer was trying to kill Jesus through Herod, his agent. Uh, and he might have succeeded had God not specifically interposed to um, send his, his son into Egypt. But yet, even in this, he was fulfilling Bible prophecy. Um, and then in John 1.46, it says, what, what element does this add to help us understand the suffering Jesus faced? And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. So in, in, this, um, in, in this part, we see that Obviously, Nazareth had a terrible reputation uh, in, in Israel so that um, people thought that it was so rotten that like nothing good could come out of there. So, I mean, it would be perhaps like the city of sin, Las Vegas might be today. That might have been the Nazareth of uh, Israel back in those days. Um, and so then I, I also found a, a quote from Desire of Ages, which I think is good because it's giving us a little bit of um, kind of insight into his early life. So the, the childhood and youth of Jesus were spent in a little mountain village. There was no place on earth that would not have been honored by his presence. The palaces of kings would have been privileged in receiving him as a guest. But he passed by the homes of wealth, the courts of royalty, and the renowned seats of learning to make his home in obscure and despised Nazareth. Wonderful as its, in its significance is the brief record of his early life. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So in the sunlight of his father's countenance, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and man. His mind was active and penetrating, with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. So I think what we're seeing here is that in spite of Jesus growing up in um, 
difficult circumstances, not with the best influences in the city of Nazareth and um, not in Egypt. And so pretty much everywhere he grew, he was under difficult circumstances, yet um, by adhering to God's word and listening to that, he was able to grow in a symmetrical, beautiful way that praised God and gave him honor. So that takes away any excuse for anybody else might say that, well, I grew up in bad circumstances, so that's why I'm doing all these bad things. So given that Jesus grew up in difficult circumstances, that gives us hope that even if you grow up in poverty and you're born in an animal uh, shelter and you're uh, living in a corrupt city, uh, you can still grow up to be a, a, an honor to God. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. As we can see, Jesus had to face crucibles very early in his life. And um, now we're going to see in Monday's section, Greg, could you please tell us a little more about this despised and rejected of men? Sure, I will do that. And good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to you. Uh, Monday's lesson, as you know, is entitled Despised and Rejected of Men. And as we read through some of the upcoming verses, I want you just to please keep in mind that Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth and that he came to offer himself not only as a sacrifice for the atonement of our sins, but also to provide himself the remedy. He is the remedy, the means by which he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can help us to overcome sin, to restore us unto himself, and restore us unto the Father. But also keep in mind too, that Jesus went through his own trial, his own crucible. So let's read Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees had heard that they said this, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So here it was that Jesus healed a demon-possessed man who was both blind and mute, yet the religious leaders accused Jesus' healing as being by the power of Beelzebub, which is another name for Satan, the prince of evil spirits, or a Philistine deity. So the religious leaders who they should have known because they had the word, they had the scriptures that pointed forward to the coming of the Messiah, but they were blinded by their own pride, their own power, their traditions. So the question is, is are we, is the world any different today? Let's now look at John chapter eight, verse 58 through 59. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so because Jesus told them the truth of who he was, they wanted to stone him to death for blasphemy because they didn't know or understand who he was. You can also go to Luke, and I, I highly recommend go to Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. We're not going to show the verses right now, but in those nine verses, it, basically they, they, the Israelites, are rejecting Jesus because he told them the truth about who he was, and he revealed their spiritual characters, the state of their hearts and their minds. And for this, he was despised and rejected by his own people, by his own country. And they were filled with such wrath that they wanted to take him out of the city and throw him off the cliff. So how did Jesus deal with these crucibles? These are just a couple examples here. Well, if we pay attention to what Jesus did, Scripture tells us he went and he prayed to the Father daily. Not only daily, but continuously. And as we read those verses, it brings to mind a very solemn and sobering question that we really should all ask ourselves. And that is, because it's very easy to point the finger at ancient Israel. 
But if we lived in the times of Jesus' ministry here on earth, would we too have rejected and treated Jesus any differently than the people of his day? Perhaps not, unless we were one of those very fortunate that uh, he physically healed directly. So other than those people, would we have acted the same way with the herd mentality that turned against Jesus? And now as we understand, whether it was by the religious leaders or political leaders or even the common people in Jesus' time, Jesus' life, his words of truth, his acts of love and compassion were constantly misunderstood, which led to rejection. Keep in mind, they were expecting something entirely different as far as a Messiah. They were expecting perhaps a very, very strong, powerful warrior that would free them from the oppression that they were under. And Jesus, in his life, as mentioned, with his words of truth, with his acts of love and compassion, they didn't understand that, and so they rejected Jesus. But Jesus never gave up on his chosen people, but they gave up on him because they didn't know him. And Jesus was grieved because he knew their rejection would lead to their ultimate destruction. And Jesus states this. If we turn to Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. Now as he draw near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace— but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they did not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. It's very powerful, but it doesn't stop there. There's further description of Jesus and the sorrow that he felt. If we turn to Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So with deep sorrow and anguish, Jesus cast his eyes upon his chosen people, the chosen people who were to carry the message of salvation to the world and to live and teach and reflect his character to the world. Their rejection, it must have hurt Jesus deeply. The weeping, you know he took on our humanity, so the weeping, he had feelings, obviously. But more importantly, Jesus' sorrow was for them because they sealed their fate by their hardened hearts, despising and rejecting the Messiah. So Jesus went through a crucible that's far more difficult than any of us could ever imagine or experience, and he did it for us. He did it for all of humanity to reconcile us back to the Father and to himself. And he is with us each day as we go through our own crucibles. He is with us. And you think about it, what a wonderful God that we serve. Look at what he went through. We can't even fathom what he went through. But he's always with us going through our crucibles. So what can we learn from today's lesson about God's character and from the past experience of God's chosen people? What can we do today to better know, understand, and teach others about the character of God? Well, through earnest prayer, earnest study of his word, and allowing the Holy Spirit to change our hearts and our minds so that we may become a reflection of his righteousness, his loving kindness, his grace, and his mercy to others. Amen. Thank you, Greg, for elaborating on some of the experiences that Christ had where he indeed was despised and rejected yeah. by men. And during his 33 years on earth, he did suffer, but nothing could compare with what he was going to suffer and experience the night of his arrest. After supper, he and his disciples headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane.
So let's pick up the story. We're going to read multiple accounts of this event. The first one is in Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 41. And then we'll also look at Matthew 26, 39 and Luke 22, 41 to 44. And as we read this, let's try to imagine what this experience must have been like for him. And um, Matthew begins, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Now we'll jump to Matthew twenty-six thirty-nine. He went a little farther and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And lastly, Luke twenty-two forty-one to 44. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. That's just a little distance. And he knelt, knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. So what do these texts tell us about God's love for us? And what do they say about Christ's suffering in Gethsemane? Well, first we see he's troubled, distressed, and sorrowful. The scene opens with him leaving most of his disciples at the entrance of Gethsemane, except for three of them, Peter, James, and John. And scripture adds in verse 33, in that chapter of, of Mark, he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And then Jesus says to those three disciples, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Had the disciples ever heard Jesus speak such unsettling, troublesome words before? Throughout his ministry, when confronting men inspired by Satan, Jesus could say, he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. That's in John 8, 20. But now, what's happening? Why is he feeling deeply troubled, distressed, and with such exceeding sorrow to the point of death? He knew his time had come when prophecy was going to be fulfilled. Isaiah had written in chapter 53, verse 12, because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was beginning to feel the guilt of fallen humanity and he would have to bear the brunt of it. In the book Desire of Ages, we read, upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear, that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. As man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin and endure the wrath of God against transgression. Secondly, 
we see him experiencing this spiritual and physical anguish. He leaves the three disciples and the intensity of the trial increases and with it so does his agony. He fell on his face on the ground and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Paul tells us what he was feeling in 2 Corinthians 5.12, for he made him, so that's God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Christ, the sinless son of God, became sin, took on sin. He had never experienced sin before. He's now feeling separation from his father and the gulf must have been so broad and deep that his spirit shuddered before it. And if he is to go through with the plan of salvation, he can't avoid this. He must not use his divine power to escape it. Can you imagine the agonizing struggle going on in his mind? The dread of separation from the Father, something that had never happened throughout eternity past, is now in one hand, and the eternal salvation of all humankind is in the other. Everything is at stake. The fate of humanity trembles in the balance. The agony is so real, he sweats, not drops of perspiration, but of blood. And lastly, we see the Father's involvement. As Jesus is contemplating the crushing situation, he prays three times, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He remains faithful to his Father and maintains steadfast in wanting to do his will. Now, how does his Father in heaven respond? Luke twenty-two forty-three records a beautiful detail. And there appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. That was the answer to Christ's prayer. God didn't send Moses or Elijah like he did once before, but he sends a mighty angel to strengthen him so that he can drink the cup with the assurance of the Father's love. Again, the desire of ages adds some additional insight to this scene. The history of, human, of mankind and the woes and lamentations of a doomed world come before him. He beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. He will save many at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood that through him perishing millions may, give, may gain everlasting life. Christ's agony did not cease but his depression and discouragement left him. The storm had in no wise abated, but he who was its object was strengthened to meet its fury. He came forth calm and serene. A heavenly peace rested upon his blood-stained face. He had borne that which no human being could ever bear, for he had tasted the sufferings of death for every man. Christ's experience in Gethsemane is the pivotal component in the plan of salvation. The depth of God's love and willingness to suffer for mankind is unfathomable and worthy of much studying prayer and contemplation. May Christ's experience in this crucible give us continued hope as we go through life's crucibles. He has experienced the most intense heat anyone will ever be subjected to. So he can get us through anything we'll be subjected to here. Now, Scott, will you please tell us about Wednesday's lesson, The Crucified God? Certainly. <clears throat> so, um, The Crucified God. Um, now, I, I just thought about the title for a second. So it seems like none of the ancient peoples, although they had dozens if not hundreds of gods. Um, as far as I remember, I don't think any of those gods were willing to die for their people. Um, so I mean the Greeks had Zeus and Apollo and Athena and Dionysus and all those gods. Not, none of them 
uh, gave up their lives for their subject. Uh, some of the false religions, they had human sacrifices to the gods, but it never went vice versa. So this kind of went contrary to, um, to the way uh, they would do things. So I thought about Paul's address uh, to, the, to the men of Athens on Mars Hill when he talks about the unknown God. And um, he, he made a very impressive speech and the Greeks were impressed with him until it got to the end and he talked about the God being crucified for his people and then they were like mocking him and saying, well, we'll hear you another time. So let me, let me pick up. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others says, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How be it certain men clave unto him, and among them was Dionysus the Aeropagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others went with them. So basically his speech to the Athenians, while it was a um, very good and amazing one, and it's, it's given in the Bible, didn't have um, a huge impact on the Athenians. So now, now let's actually focus on what, what happened at the cross. So in Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46, it says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, you know, it says that death by crucifixion was one of the harshest punishments the Romans meted out to anyone. It was considered the worst way to die. Thus, how horrific for anyone to be killed that way, in particular the Son of God. Jesus, we must always remember, came in human flesh like ours. Between the beatings, scourgings, nails hammered into his hands and feet, and the harrowing weight of his own body tearing at the wounds and physical pain must have been unbearable. This harsh, even uh, this was harsh even for the worst of criminals. Uh, how unfair then that Jesus, innocent of everything, should face such a fate. Um, but I think the part that Satan must have known and why he was doing this was because he knew that Christ had the power to deliver himself. Um, so unlike the other criminals who were um, helpless in front of their executors. Jesus was not helpless. He could um, easily have called some angels to his aid, and if he didn't even need the angels. He could have just gotten off the cross and walked away. Um, and then, let's see. Um, and then the next thing I was going to focus on is, and I think that's where the lesson is going with these verses, is um, basically signs that from Jesus' death that he was not uh, any common man that might have been executed. So he, here's, I, I came up with seven signs and I've learned something from our pastor, Pastor Joseph, about chiastic structures. So I've come up with seven, uh, shall we call them miracles or seven signs that Christ's death was anything but an ordinary criminal's death. So here's the, uh, the seven signs I came up with. Um, and these sign one goes along with sign seven, two along with six, three with five, and then four is in the middle. So unfortunately, I didn't draw it out. So I guess it's not on the screen. Uh, but anyway, so the first sign was the supernatural darkness that occurred in the midst of the day. So it says it occurred from noon to 3 p.m. Um, and we'll have to remember that their first hour was 6 a.m. So for them, six, sixth hour was actually noon. Um, and the ninth hour would have been 3 p.m. Uh, and then the second sign uh, was the massive temple veil torn from top to bottom. And that was without human hands. Because indeed, if humans had been tearing it, this was a very tall, um, tall curtain, and it was heavy. So they, humans would have had to start tearing it at the bottom. They couldn't start at the top. But God specifically was showing that this was not done by human hands by starting it from the top. The third sign was an earthquake, which marked his, uh, his death. And then 
Um, one part that was kind of interesting to me, I don't know if you guys had noted this, but the sepulchers were rent at Christ's death, not at his resurrection. I always thought it was at his mm -hmm. resurrection when those sepulchers were rent, when Christ mm -hmm. was resurrected. But it seemed like they were resurrected even before Christ was resurrected. Um, so then the fifth sign was again an earthquake. This was when he was um, resurrected, or not resurrected, but when he came back to life at uh, the angel Gabriel uh, being the messenger. And then the sixth sign was the massive stone which was rolled away by the mighty angel. And the seventh was a bright light in the middle of the night. So on sign one we had darkness during the day and number seven we had bright light during the night. Two and six were massive veil torn and massive stone rolled away. Uh, three and five were earthquakes and four was the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, and then let's go back and read some of that, those verses. So in Matthew 27, 51 and 52, it says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, uh, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, after the resurrection, they went unto the holy city and appeared to many. Uh, so, so that was the, the part that was interesting to me, that they were resurrected right after Christ died. Um, and then in Mark 15, 38 and 39, and there's kind of an interesting one is that it says, um, it repeats, the, te the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed out his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So even a uh, heathen man, as the Jews would have called him a heathen, um, was able to notice that there was something uh, unusual about his death. Um, and then I, I was also going to bring up that the lie which the Jewish leaders tried to tell in order to obscure the, the fact of Jesus' resurrection was completely inconsistent. This is pointing out, pointed out also in the Desire of Ages. Um, so I, I've had occasions when I've tried to sneak out quietly, like not to wake up my wife just to go to the bathroom or just to get out of bed. And uh, that's like a 50-50 chance. And that's with me leaving the lights off, not creating an earthquake, and not uh, rumbling away some heavy several ton stone. So I'm like, how, how do 100 Roman soldiers all sleep through, um, through the events which were pretty much designed to wake up even the dead, <laughs> apparently? Because... <laughs> Christ was dead, and there were other dead people that may have been resurrected either at that point or at some previous time. But anyway, um, rolling away this massive stone coming with so much energy that he created an earthquake and a bright light, that was pretty much guaranteed to wake up everybody. <laughs> Even if the Romans had slept, they, they would not have uh, continued sleeping after that. Uh, but I think the earthquake was felt by other people around, so... Um, um, let's see. Likewise, today there's a, this thought in the world that there's going to be a secret rapture at the second coming of Christ. Well, that seems just like uh, as plausible as the secret rapture of Jesus' body at his, um, at his first resurrection. Uh, well, at his resurrection when he was here on the first advent to earth because um, Christ himself said that he will be like the lightning from one end of the sky to the other so that every eye would see him that doesn't sound secret at all <laughs> so um, be aware of deceivers that tell you to go to secret uh, chambers or into the desert because they're imposters Christ said you know every eye is going to see me and if not every eye sees me then don't even bother to look. You know he's an imposter. That's not how I'm coming. He's like, that's not how I roll. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have everybody see me. The, the only point is that you have to be prepared for him to come. And if you're not prepared, then you'll be crying to the rocks to fall on you. 
Amen. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay. And we're going to continue um, covering Thursday. Greg, would you please explain a little more how God has, um, has such love for us to suffer um, affliction on our behalf, but the hope that comes along with Amen. that. Amen. I think that's one of the key aspects is there's all this suffering, but the hope. And we're going to go Amen. through a lot of scripture on that hope promises from God as we get towards the end of this. But Thursday's lesson is titled, The Suffering God. As we read through some of the upcoming verses, please keep in mind two things. One, God the Father, as stated in John 3, 16, think of this, God the Father. So God loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And secondly, that Jesus was, is divine, yet he took on our humanity to save us, to be an example to us, and to restore us. And as Ellen White wrote, Jesus wrapped his divinity in humanity. And I think that's just so powerful. So Jesus came to restore us unto himself and to the Father, if and only if we are willing to let him do so. So again, so for today's lesson, the suffering God, we're going to look at three different areas. The first area is Jesus and his crucible. And the whole quarter has been centered on the crucible with Jesus. But Jesus, as we know, as we've been reading and studying, Jesus went through the crucible of crucibles of the highest magnitude. One that, again, we're never going to experience nor truly comprehend. So again, the question is, so why did Jesus do this? And Mary had, had mentioned one of the reasons why. Because he loves us. God the Father and Jesus love us and want to save fallen humanity. But I would even say overarching that is because of Jesus' love for the Father. To reflect his Father's true character and his nature. Because remember in heaven, Lucifer maligned the character of the Father before the entire universe. So we in turn just got a glimpse through scripture of Jesus' suffering through his crucible. And as we heard, Mary described in, uh, and presented in Tuesday's lesson some of that. And Scott also presented some of the suffering and crucible that Christ went through in Wednesday's lesson at the cross. And I just think we're going to be spending eternity trying to grasp the magnitude of the crucible of the suffering that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit went through for each of us. So the second area that I want to look at is Jesus suffered for us. Should we expect to suffer for Jesus? Okay, so now we're going to start to go through a lot of scripture. So you may just want to watch the screen. Keep your Bible with you, but just watch the screen because I'm going to go really fast here. So again, Jesus suffered for us. Should we expect to suffer for Jesus? Well, Jesus tells us in Acts 14, 22, strengthening the souls of his disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So the crucibles that we're going through, they're either going to lead us closer to God or turn us away from God. It's our choice. God gives us the freedom of choice. But keep in mind, to give up on him, that will lead us to sin, which ultimately leads us to eternal death. And so, yes, we're going to go through trials and tribulations and pain and suffering in this world. But what does God promise us in return if we overcome, if we abide in him? The good news is that despite all the pain and suffering that we go through, Jesus promises to all who believe in him and have faith in him several things. And we're going to go through these real quickly. So John chapter 10, verse 28. And I gave them eternal life that they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. 
Wonderful, powerful. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. We know that, right? So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 2.25, and this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Now I want to give you just um, some additional promises that God gave to us. And if we turn to the book of Revelation, to the seven churches of Revelation. Who makes up the churches? The people, believers. We are the ones. So those were seven literal churches that existed back then, but prophetically they represent a time uh, perspective of the Christian church from apostolic times to the second coming of Jesus. And if they're about us individually, it represents our walk in Christianity. We may find ourselves in our spiritual walk with Christ, with God, in any one of those churches at any given time. So he's talking to us and he's promising those who overcome a number of things. So let's go through this. Revelation 2, 7. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 11. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death, Praise God for that. Revelation 2, 17. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except he who receives it. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not, this is so important, and I will not blot, blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 3.12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Revelation 3.21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And the last one of Revelation, Revelation 21.7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Praise God. Those are just but a few of the promises that God makes to us as we go through the crucibles in our lives. But know this, as we're going through those crucibles, as we're suffering, as God had suffered, Jesus is always with us through the crucibles we face. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us, For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And this is one that we should all take to heart because this is so um, powerful. We should all have this memorized. John 14, verse 2 through 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. See, we don't go to heaven, hell, or purgatory, or anything like that. Jesus is saying, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And just in closing, I'd like to just finish with a brief reading um, that Ellen White describes in Selected Messages, book number three, page 129, because I think this kind of just sums it up from a macro perspective of all what this means. All the suffering, which is the result of sin, was poured into the bosom of the sinless Son of God. Satan was bruising the heel of Christ. But every pang endured by Christ, every grief, every disquietude was fulfilling the great plan of man's redemption. Every blow inflicted by the enemy was rebounding on himself. Christ was bruising the serpent's head. We should all give thanks and praise to God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and thank you to the Holy Spirit for everything that you have done for us and everything that you continue to do for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for, um, for elaborating on the suffering of Christ and the hope that we have if we overcome. And Scott, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with so, us? I was going to end with chapter 22 in Revelation because after Jesus' suffering, um, he's rewarding our suffering with eternal life. So he okay. says, 
This is in Revelation 22:12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to the work, as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they which do the commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and enter through the gates into the city. We'll just end there. Thank you very much for sharing that. What hope. So this quarter, we've learned that as we journey through life with its many different turns, we'll inevitably experience crucibles along the way, which brings suffering, evil, and death. But we've learned that as Christians, we have a shepherd by our side to guide us along our journey, and that the Father is at work too, working in us whom he is predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. The sufferings purify us as gold is purified in the fire, so that we may reflect Jesus' image. We've also studied about the extreme heat and struggles within the crucible, but that we have indestructible hope in our invisible Heavenly Father through faith. And because of this faith, we can praise him and have a humble, meek spirit, even within these crucibles. We've also learned about waiting, and last week we learned about even dying while in life's crucibles. And lastly, we've studied that God has experienced crucibles on our behalf. His suffering and ultimate sacrifice were made to save us. We can go through any difficult situation that comes our way because Jesus has gone through and he will sustain us and bring us through victoriously. New creatures made in his image as we were intended to be. Praise God. I'd like to invite you to please bow your heads as we end our Sabbath school study. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for the wonderful promise of life eternal that your Son and you and the Holy Spirit planned and the salvation of mankind. Thank you for the suffering that you went through in order to save us. And as an example for us, Lord, to know that despite whatever we may be going through, it'll never be greater than what you went through and that you are there to strengthen us. And as we're going through life's crucibles, you are reshaping us, purifying us, recreating us and molding us into the image of Christ. And we look so forward to the day when you will be done with that work and your son will come to get us and take us home to spend eternity with you. Thank you for your love, your grace, your sacrifice, and for the hope you give us. Please help us to dwell upon these wonderful themes in your word throughout the rest of the Sabbath day and delve into it more throughout this week, Lord. We thank you for all that you do for us in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath.